Or do I want to agree with God and say, yes, there is something wrong with me, and Lord Jesus, you're the only one that can make it right. Yes. Which, which of those two things do you want to be in? And we need to run to God. Repentance is not popular. And the reason, and the way we know it's not popular is because we see how many people are not doing it. <laughs> They're just not doing it. And so, uh, as we teach this, store it away, preach it. I think the things that I'm teaching, not because I'm teaching them, are all vital in our <coughs> preaching. Um, so we're going to look at this thing called repentance. Repentance is, uh, in a biblical term, meaning to turn or to change one's life, change one's direction, and even change one's mind about their state of sin or their life. Uh, we often, or I often, illustrate it by, I'm going through life, I'm heading this way before I knew Jesus. I'm heading toward and walking in the direction that I want to go in. This is the things that I want to do. These are the things I want to be involved with. But then God grabs a hold of your heart and your mind and you confess that uh, what I'm doing is wrong. You agree with God. And that agreement with God makes you change your mind about what you've been doing. Changing it from it's okay to it's sinful and wrong. And I turn in the opposite direction toward God. Repentance is not, just, is not only turning away from sin. It's turning away from sin and turning toward God. I think a lot of people, they'll turn away from this sin and they won't turn all the way to God, they'll turn to another sin. And something else and something else. And, and they'll keep looking until they, perhaps one day might meet God. But true repentance is turning yourself and changing your mind and agreeing with God and going in His direction. Repentance is a threefold action in understanding that we acknowledge our sin. We have knowledge of our sin. We understand. And it, but it's not enough just to know you're a sinner, right? I can't just go through life and say, well, I'm a sinner. And that's just the way it's going to be. If, if God has, has shined the light of His conviction upon your sin, He does so because He wants to reveal it so that you might confess it. I remember as a, as a young boy, about 10, 11, 12 years old, I wasn't very active in church. My mom took me to church, but my dad rarely went. They both go to church now, both are saved. I, in fact, I'm their pastor. They, they are members of my church. But I remember lying in bed and thinking about my day. And this is well before I was a, a, a disciple of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit would begin to convict me and speak to me. I didn't know it was the Holy Spirit. I had no idea. But He would remind me of things I did throughout the day. And I would think, that's not that bad. And here's the next thing I would think. God's not going to get me for that. It was sin. And God was warning me. But in my flesh, but in my flesh, I thought I was okay. But God was reminding me of my sin and reminding me that um, uh, I was not good enough alone by myself without Him. And He was warning me to get right. And I praise the Lord, He was patient with me and long-suffering with me. And He brought me to a place of repentance and salvation. So there's an understanding of sin, but there's also uh, the feeling, the threefold action also includes feeling that you feel guilt and shame. How many of you feel guilt and shame when you sin? You, you know why you feel guilt when you sin? Because you're guilty. <laughs> right? And we hate that feeling. But God allows the feeling of guilt to be there 
in order that we would repent. Now, one thing we have to be careful of is the devil will remind you of old sins. But you've got to remind him and remind yourself that the Word of God teaches us that once we've asked forgiveness, we are separated from that sin as far as the east is from the west. God throws it into that sea of forgetfulness. We are whiter than snow. It is gone, never to be brought back again. It's not God who will bring, you, bring up old sin that you've been forgiven of. Satan will do that, and we've got to recognize that because the enemy will try to beat you down with your past sins and tell you you're not a good Christian to try to make you ineffective. And you might feel guilty all over again. Mm -hmm. And I've said it yesterday, I'll say it again today. The Word of God, the truth of God's Word, overrides your feelings. Feelings don't mean much. You can get feelings in doing the right things, but you can't gauge your obedience by your feelings. You gauge your obedience by the Word of God. So there's understanding of your sins. There's feelings of that guilt and grief. And then there's uh, the, the third action is of the will. <clears throat> As I said, it's a change of mind. Turning around. It's a realization of self and the despair of guilt and the renouncing of self. I, 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 I forsake my, my way of living in order to live for Jesus. Paul said in Romans 7, 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? The Lord, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not willing that anyone should perish. The condition God set forth is that a person must believe His Son, Jesus Christ, and in salvation... Salvation consists of regeneration, which is what God does. He gives us new life. And then on our side, there's an action of repentance and faith. We turn away from our sin and place our faith in the Lord Jesus. Conversion, meaning repentance and faith, is the condition for regeneration. So let's look in the Scriptures quickly before the next little while about this word repentance. First of all, let's look at, and this will sound unusual, the repentance of God. Now, the repentance of God and the repentance of man are two separate issues. They're different. What do we repent of? Sin. And what did I tell you repentance was? Changing of the mind, a changing of the heart, a changing of direction, and it's all about we change our own, or, or we allow God to change our heart, mind, and direction to align with Him. God doesn't have sin to repent of. So God will, but God, in the Scriptures, it shows that God changes His mind. He changes his mind when we act according to the way he has told us to act. Many, many times in the Bible we'll read where it says, unless you repent, I will bring destruction. Think about, think about the Ninevites that God sent Jonah to. <clears throat> what did he tell them? Unless you guys repent, destruction's coming, judgment's coming. And it said that Jonah got there, and what did he do? He preached, and it was a big city. And in the three day, the first three days, he said, from the from the smallest to the oldest, they repented. It says that God changed his mind about their destruction. Um, the word repent in the Old Testament means to feel sorry or feel comforted in order to portray the nature of God in terms we understand. We, we use terms we use terms to describe him in, in, in human terms. Does that make sense? We, we can't always describe God sufficiently with our, with our, our language. We're limited in our, in our wisdom, in our language, in our words. 
And so sometimes we use words, human terms, to describe the action of God. And that's the best we can do. He doesn't repent like we think of repent, but repent means that he changed his mind. But, but it's even hard to say he changes his mind, right? Because when we say God changed his mind, it almost makes it sound like, well, God was wrong the first time and had to change his mind the second time. That's not what I'm saying. God wasn't wrong. But God said, if you will do this, then I will do this. If we don't do what God has said, God doesn't have to change his actions. And so, when God says, I will do this, if you will do this, then it says that God changed his mind and withheld his judgment, withheld those things for us. Uh, the, the writers in the Old Testament use that word repent in a sense of to change mind. And this is seen uh, um, in all the references of the Old Testament. God's repentance is based on a conditional and unconditional covenants he made with man. <clears throat> As I said, it seems to contradict itself <clears throat> that, that God would have to change his mind because it makes it sound like God made a mistake and he didn't do that. He's just responding to what he has said and the promise he has made if man would repent. So, so God does repent. Look, I, I remind you what Genesis 6, 6 says. God repented that he had made man. In that sense, the word repentant means he was sorry. Your, your, your word, your Bible may use the word sorry. He was sorrowful. I think my, my version says he was sorrowful. That he made, why, did he, why was he sorry he made man? You remember what? Why God sent the flood? What did it say about man? That his that that the intent of man's heart was only what evil. How often? All the time. Now listen, I, I believe aside from Christ, I'm a bad evil person. I, I have a hard time describing myself as being evil all the time. But that's what God's Word said. That the intent of man's heart was only evil all the time. And so, the repentance of God is shown in Genesis 6.3. Uh, 3. It says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. The warning went unheeded, and man did not change. In fact, according to Genesis 6 5, man became more wicked. Yep. And because man's failure to change, God repented, or God was sorry that he had made man on earth and grieved, and he grieved his heart. There's a, there's a great statement in that story. Once God put Noah on the ark and his family because it sounded like it sounded like God was done with man, right? I'm, I'm through. I'm finished. And he had every right to wipe off the face of the earth every man, woman, child, including Noah and his family because they were sinful. Now they, they strove, strived, <laughs> they tried their best to honor the Lord, but Noah was a man just like us. But he found favor he found favor in God's eyes. He found grace, is what it says. Even though we needed grace. Even the best of us need the grace of God. And so God was sorry he made man. So in the, in the story of Noah, God's repenting means he, he was sorry he made man. Um, God's repentance signifies a change in relationship and, and circumstances. Uh, if you look at uh, Jeremiah 18, that passage, you read that God repents. It says, if that nation turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil I thought to do to them. It's conditional. He's not saying, this is what I'm going to do, period. 
And then later on, well, I changed my mind. He's saying, it's a conditional statement. If you will turn from your evil ways, I will withhold my judgment. That's good news. That's, that's really good news. Um, uh, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. That's good news. It's a contract. If we'll accept the good news, he will relent from the judgment he will cast upon us. Um, Jeremiah 18 10 says, If it does evil in my sight, so that it does not obey my voice, I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit. There he says, He'll change his mind about giving you good if you don't start doing right. Or if you start doing evil, excuse me. God will bend toward Nineveh because they turned from their evil after Jonah preached as God instructed them. Um, so you see that, that God uh, repents only when the people meet His conditions. He turns away from judgment if the people change. He will turn away from judgment if people change. He also turns <clears throat> turns to judgment if people do not obey His word. In some sense, God God responds to how we behave. But we're to behave as to how God tells us to behave. If we don't obey, judgment will come. If we do obey, we will get blessings from, uh, from that. God does not repent based on an unconditional covenant. When God makes an unconditional covenant, He never repents. He never changes. It stands <clears throat> forever. It says in Psalm 110, verse 4, the Lord has sworn and it will and will not repent. Meaning there are some things God says that are that are black and white. They are steadfast. They are sure. This is how it's going to be and I will not move from it. It's not a conditional statement. Yes, sir. Okay, in this case of the 102 years of... What's that? Oh, I don't want to find that when... Yeah. When God said the men... I will not strike with the men in this case of the 102 years of... Right. You remember before the flood, man lived hundreds and hundreds of years. Noah, I mean, uh, Adam and Eve lived up to the 900 years. You know, uh, all those folks lived to be extremely old. Um, and then after the flood, it, I, I don't know if something happened environmentally because of the flood. Obviously, I believe God, God's hand was in it. And God says, I won't let man live more than about 120 years. And that, that doesn't mean that everybody lived to 120. Just like uh, later on the scripture says, um, uh, basically man lives to about 70. Right? It, or is it 80? Yeah, 70. 70, I thought it was 70. Three score and 10. Three score and 10, thank you. But it doesn't mean it's hard and fast. The average age of people that, that live to old age is about 70 to 75 years old. That's the average age. Mm -hmm. um, here, he said part of his judgment, I, I, I'm assuming part of his judgment is, I'm not going to let you live that long anymore. Just part of the judgment. I'm going I'm to cap it at about 120 years. Why 120 years? I don't know. But that's just what he said. That's the best answer I can give you. So, uh, I, I don't know why he did it that way. Um, maybe because... He didn't want them to get worse in their sin as they got older. Because if you get once you get set, more than likely you're going to stay there. The average age, you know the average age, I can speak for America, the average age of someone coming to Christ is 12. If someone in America does not come to Christ by the age of 12, the likelihood of them becoming a Christian is very, very slim. Very small. It's important to reach people when you're younger. Because once you start getting older and you get set in your ways, when you get used to doing the things you've always done and you don't see another way of doing it, 
you'll stay that way forever. Yep. Now it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that that people older than 12 can't get saved in America because they certainly can. My dad, last September, yeah, God. gave his life to Christ and he's in his late 70s. Mm -hmm. Now, he tells me that he got saved when he was a young man like when he was 12. But then from 12 to about 75, he didn't go to church until they moved in our area and they came to our church they both professed the Lord. They said they were saved. They joined our church. And then we had a, 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 a meeting and, and, and David Burton preached. And my dad walked up to me and said, I need the Lord. Oh, Holy moly, what do you do? It's not to cry. Amen. And, and so later I talked to my dad and he said, well, it was so long ago, I didn't know if it's still, still real. <laughs> and so the question is not so much for my dad, did he get saved at 12 or did he get saved at 78? The issue with my dad is he saved. Yeah. Amen. Doesn't matter what, what year, what day. Yeah. I, I don't care. I'm just glad he's going to be in heaven with me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so my, but my point is, once you get past your teen years, it's harder to get saved. I, that may be part of why God said, I'm not going to let you go past 120. Because you're just going to get deeper and deeper in sin and maybe accumulate more judgment. I don't know. It's just a thought. So, I'm sorry I can't give a better answer. <laughs> so, um, so, the covenant, the, co the, the unconditional promises there um, show us those things. Um, so, God, God repents on those conditional promises. Now let's look at the repentance of man. The meaning of the repentance of man. In the New Testament, there are three Greek words. I won't give you the Greek word for it, but the, the words for repentance. One of them means, the first one is a verb, and it means to regret or being annoyed with the results of sin or remorse. Having remorse for your sin. The word is used by Judas. If you read the story of Judas and Peter, right? Peter denied Christ. Judas betrayed Christ. The scriptures in the English translation say that Judas repented. Was sorry. Well, that almost sounds like he got saved. But he didn't, did he? In fact, Jesus called him the son of perdition. Uh, Judas was sorry because he made a horrible choice and never repented of it and took the money and bought a field and hung himself and died in his sin. Peter made a horrible choice of denying Christ and even left the ministry for a little bit if you read John chapter 21, yeah. mm -hmm. he went back to his old life. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I love this. John 21, I think, is my favorite chapter in all of Scripture. I, you need to read it and chew on it. But John 21, when Peter leaves the ministry, he says, you know what? I'm not real good at this discipling thing. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go fishing. Yeah. That was his old life. And what's the next thing say? What's the next scripture say? And others went with him. You're either leading people to Jesus or away from Jesus. That's it. But Jesus was faithful to Peter even though Peter wasn't faithful to Jesus. And Jesus went and found Peter. And when Peter realized it was Jesus on the shore, what did, she, what did Peter do? Man, he girded himself. He jumped in the lake, swam to the shore, and could not wait to get to Jesus. I think that maybe his point of, of, of repentance right there. He didn't have to say a word. His heart said everything he needed to say. But then Jesus pulled him aside and we had that great conversation, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. I love that. It just, there's just so much good stuff there. But you see the difference in Judas and Peter. I wonder, and it's 
It's an unanswerable question. But I wonder, had Judas hung around, had Judas been available to Jesus, maybe Jesus would have sought Judas out. Amen. And said, Judas, you only did what you had to do, but I'm willing to forgive you. Ju G I, I promise you, Jesus would have forgiven him. Because he, he would forgive anybody from the new repentance. Mm -hmm. But when the scriptures say that Judas repented, it doesn't mean he re repented in a godly sorrow. He had worldly sorrow. He got caught. Yep. Mm -hmm. He got caught. And he just, he was, he was sorry. I believe that he considered himself a friend of Jesus. He spent three and a half years with Jesus. And now he understood, man, I've, I've turned Jesus over to the authorities. I know what's going to happen to him. I don't want my friend to die. But all that thinking was devoid of the fact that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God. And so it says that he repented, but it was just that he was sorry. He was sorry what he had done, but not sorry enough to change his mind, not sorry enough to repent to the Lord. It's not enough just to be sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I, I've had conversations with my children. And they'll say, well, I'm sorry, Dad. And I'll tell them this. Don't tell me you're sorry with your mouth or your words. Show me you're sorry by not doing it again. Right? That's, and that's what God wants to see. He knows our heart, but He wants our life to reveal it. And so the repentance of man... Um, so that, I went a little longer on that than I meant to. So the first one means to be sorry. The second one means to change one's mind. It's a changing of mind. We agree with God. The last one is to change mind in respect to sin. So the second one is to change your mind like God changes His mind, so to speak. Except it's a different, again, it's a different um, context there. But the last one is to change one mind in respect to sin. Um, the meaning of repentance is a change, an act of the will with respect to sin that leads to change of conduct. It is changing one's direction toward God. So, if you really repent, if you really change your mind about sin, you won't do it anymore. You won't live in it anymore. Does that mean you'll never do it again? Hopefully not. You might. But your attitude is still, man, I, I didn't mean to. I didn't want to do that. And I did it anyway. I want, and that's what I said last night. We've got to live in, a, in, a, in an atmosphere or a, 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 a place in our life of continual repentance. Be ready to repent when we sin. Be ready to go to God and confess those things. John the Baptist, in his message, when he was announcing Jesus in Matthew 3, verse 2, said, Repent, for the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus began his public ministry and throughout his ministry he talked about repentance. Matthew 4 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why would he say that? Well, the only way you're going to see the kingdom of heaven is to repent. Thank you. That's how you're going to see the kingdom of heaven is to repent, to change your mind, uh, to go the way you were going, to go the way that God wants you to go. Jesus called sinners to repent. Matthew 9, 13. But go and learn from uh, what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not call uh, the righteous but the sinners to repentance. If you are walking with the Lord well, you may not need to repent of anything. 